I'm interviewing Rachel Proudfoot of the White Rose Consortium. I'm going to ask her first of all about what White Rose is, just to give us some general background. And then I'm going to ask about the experience they've had of implementing embedded repositories in three different institutions. But what we're going to focus on is the general message is that anybody working on a repository who is trying to look at extending its reach within the university, embedding it in other university processes, is going to face from the practical point of view. So first of all, Rachel, I'd just like to ask a bit about the repository, about the kind of range it has, and about the universities involved in it. OK, well, the White Rose repository was set up about seven years ago as part of the original JISC Sherpa project. It's a shared repository. It's a single instance of ePrints, which sits at, on a server in the University of Leeds, and it's shared between the University of Leeds, Sheffield and York. So it's a fully shared service between the three institutions. Originally, just covered peer-reviewed, um, published literature, but the collection policy has sort of softened a bit over the years. So we try and match a little bit more fully now with what the different subject areas need from a, a repository. And we've run various projects and initiatives to try and embed the repository more fully over the, over the years. One of the main developments was an additional repository for e-theses, doctoral e-theses and masters by research, which again is fully shared, and a single instance of e-prints at the University of Leeds. And in a couple of years ago, all three of the White Rose partnerships started to look at current research information systems. So the first to go live was Leeds with Symplectic, Sheffield's also gone with Symplectic, and York's gone with the Pure system. So the main challenge recently has been to make sure that the repository carries on running linked in with the different current research information systems at the partners. What will the users of a current research information system see in terms of the repository content, or the other way around, users of the repository see mm. in terms of current research content? How, how does it enhance their experience to have these links? Okay. So if we take the example of Symplectic, which is the most fully developed service that we've got, which is at the University of, of Leeds, Symplectic doesn't actually come with any repository functionality built in. So out of the box, it can offer you a publication database. So for example, you can feed publication, database, uh, publication data to your web pages, which is great. But what you don't have is any full text content behind that. So the two systems can work quite well together to allow the academics to populate not just metadata but full text as well. The mechanism for deposit is relatively straightforward uh, in the symplectic system. So if you're looking at, uh, say, a journal article entry, there's a simple tab that you can click on, upload the full text of the file, and that gets fired automatically to the White Rose system. So from an academic's point of view, you only have to interact with one system, which is the symplectic system. Now, from a repository perspective, you may have mixed feelings about that. It does mean that we've had to rethink really what the repository is about and what sort of services we want to offer, because some of the services that we had been planning and working towards offering, and which I know some repositories offer, like web page feeds and nice mechanisms for getting material into your repository, to some extent, they are now taken on by the Symplectic product. So I think the focus changed to working more closely with, with that product and looking at the author's experience of deposit through Symplectic. And we have to think really about how we still maintain a profile for White Rose and make sure that it isn't just a back-end hidden part of a current research information system, because I think that's that's the danger that, that that can happen. And I think if you're too hidden, it's not so obvious maybe to the academic that although it's simple to upload, why would you? Why would you? So the, the advocacy arguments, the advocacy case, is still exactly the same. It's just that what the way that we've gone is that we see some of the uh, function, the service functions being taken on by the research information system, which allows us to concentrate really on promoting the main message which is still around open access and around simplicity of deposit and demonstrating to academics that okay they're already interacting with Symplectic because uh, you need to that will be the platform where you gather your research excellence framework material for example and it's a simple extra step to then add your file to your metadata 
So that's the kind of main cell that we're trying to push at the moment. Now that sounds very interesting because one of the things you've drawn attention to there is the need to communicate, to continue to communicate with academics yeah. about this. Mm -hmm. In terms of thinking about the embedding process, did you have a lot of time to plan for that? Or was it a fairly rapid process of everything happening quite quickly once the decision had been made to go ahead with it? And I'm wondering what you would say to anybody faced with a similar situation where something is going to be introduced like that. Yeah. How should they set about it? What should they think about first of all? Okay. Okay, so we've had different experiences at the different partners, and I won't go into the specifics, but I think the key thing to be aware of is what is happening at your institution, what uh, initiatives are, are in the pipeline, and making sure that the library is involved in the decision-making process as early as possible. And that will give you a better chance of really being able to plan for embedding. And also rethink your repository and think about what your longer-term strategy for the repository is how does that fit with the developments at your institution? Do you need to make a case for your repository to be the publication database as well as an open access database? Will it fit nicely with the current research information system that you're buying? Does the current research information system already have a repository system? Um, will there be an element of competition? So it's just being aware of what, what sorts of um, discussions might need to happen. And then in terms of planning for embedding, I'd say it's going to take you longer than you think. And then. If you double what you think it's going to take, it's probably going to take even longer than that. So the connection between a current research information system and repositories, okay, there are a growing number of examples up and down the UK, but it's still a relatively new development. And certainly talking to other people, we felt that it was, it was taking us too long, that we were kind of getting bogged down and finding it difficult to link the two systems. Uh, however, I don't think that's too uncommon an experience. So have a think about how the pieces of, of the system fit together, who you need to talk to, and also, of course, you can work in concert with your research office or whoever's heavily involved with the research information system. And certainly at one of the institutions, that was a very useful process where we were able to um, promote both systems at the same time. So although the connection has taken a little bit longer than we would have liked, uh, it did give us an opportunity to go out with the people promoting the system. And I would say that it definitely changed the attitude to people in the room. It gave us an in, so because it was being promoted across the institution, there was an opportunity there to get to a wide range of schools. And I think it was taken seriously because it was an institution-wide system. I think one problem that we've always found is that we're in a bit of a silo, a bit sort of out in the cold, and so embedding from an IT perspective has been quite challenging for us. So the current research information system developments, although it's a mixed blessing, in some ways does help us to come in from the cold a bit, linked to a system that's plugged into other IT systems at the institution and gives us a bit of, if you like, heavyweight credibility to some mm -hmm. extent. It's double-edged, and there are downsides to it as well, but I do think from, from our experience so far, being involved in that process um, has helped with embedding in that once you've got one of those systems, not everybody uses it straight away, but it's quite surprising how quickly academics take up use of the current research information system. You might have automatic feeds from bibliographic databases that's going to pull metadata in for you. And so there are some sweeteners, if you like, to persuade academics to become involved with that system. You may be using it to feed web pages, which again, is a good incentive to get academics to either interact themselves or you know, nominate an administrator in the department. So use the strengths of the research information system and that embedding process to help your own open access repository embedding. That sounds like a very useful message um, to take the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. Have you found that this is paying off in terms of the uh, amount of material that's coming into the repository now through this new workflow and through the, the higher profile that you've got? Yeah. What kind of difference is it making to the level of It's the still relatively early days, so the connector that's been longer standing is, is the one at, at the University of Leeds. I'd say it has made a difference. Um, we have more content coming in, although it's not a massive difference. Mm. So I, I think, you know, as ever, you, you need to keep advocating in the same way as we always have done, and you need to refresh that advocacy year on year. 
um, it, even though we're plugged in and sort of from an IT perspective a little bit more embedded actually the message still needs to get out there that this is a service for you and just to raise awareness that, that we're there. Um, however, I think it has had some impact. So, for example, um, we, we're getting a lot more conference papers coming in. Why? Well, actually some of the mechanisms that were used in the past to get content were perhaps a little bit artificial, although they did work. So, for example, you might look and say, well, what's been published in Web of Science recently? And we would contact people but we would only contact them for stuff that we knew we could use. So we were sort of artificially um, sculpting the, the content. Not we didn't want to do that, but that was just a one practical mechanism of getting people to, you know, persuading people to give, a, give us their stuff and deposit their material. So I'd say we're getting more, so in terms of journal articles, we're getting more journal articles deposited, but they tend to be the published version of the article. Now, that's because it's a slightly more organic process, so it's not necessarily a department that we've targeted. It might be an individual who's found the deposit tab or has become aware that there is this opportunity to deposit. Great. There is Romeo data in there, but you know that's obviously not dissuading them from putting the published version on. But that's okay. That gives us more contacts. We can explain the version issue um, to the depositor, so it gives us an opportunity to just push that message back to them and explain why we can't make that particular version of the journal um, live and in that case we would always make the metadata live anyway so they've got something to show for what they've done and in terms of the conference papers well that's people want to deposit them so there isn't necessarily an obvious place to put them some of them will be published some not but i think well that's that's again it's it's a slightly more organic way of growing your content it's what the people, what the academics want to put into the repository. They feel it's useful, they want to get it out there. It might be before the conference, perhaps they want to refer people to it, or the conference might have happened quite recently. So I was looking at the stats recently in terms of full text and metadata only records for leads. And we've always tried to be full text, but the reality is you've got stuff that's embargoed or it's wrong version, or you know, you just don't have a file. And Prior to the research information system, it was about 84% full text, something like that. And I was expecting that to have fallen, and it has fallen, but not massively. It's now about 80%. And that's partly because we're getting more journals deposited where we can't use the right version. But, you know, I think that's just something we have to tackle over time and uh, you know, repeat the advocacy message. But the reason it hasn't fallen too much is because we're getting more stuff that we can make available, but it's not necessarily always the core open access content that we might have aimed at prior to the current research information system. You mentioned that you'd actually worked with three different firms on this because of the, across the institutions. Drawing out general, is there something people should be prepared for when they start working with outside software developers or even other software teams from within the institution? What kind of demands did they make of you? Mm. And did it create a lot of extra pressure on your work? Uh, did you find they understood what the repository was for? Yeah. And how, how should people it, set I about think, that? Mm, I think, again, I don't want to be too specific, no. but if you think about the field in general, there are products that don't come with a repository and products that do come with a repository. Products that do come with a repository obviously have a different um, mission, if you like, that they, they will give you a different cell. So you might need to think again about uh, how you... You need to be sure that the repository that you ha already have is uh, fit for purpose, that you want to keep it, that it has a long life, and be prepared to make that case if you don't want to go with the um, research information system inbuilt repository. I think that the experience with the inbuilt repositories in the UK is very limited, so it might be fantastic, I don't know. But it's something perhaps to be aware of and think about, depending upon who's in the frame to provide your research information system. Did it make demands on our time? Yes, it did, and it, and it was kind of more complicated than, than we anticipated. So there's a, a, a process of, of cross-walking fields from one system to your repository system, which sounds very simple. It should be simple. We, it would have been better if it had been simpler. And I think, really, don't make any assumptions about what the company understands mm -hmm. about your repository. You need to be really clear with them what it's for, but you also need to provide them information about what your item types are and all the fields associated with those item types and ask them to do the same. And although well, we did get information from the suppliers, 
um, and they all do tackle this in different ways. It's not always humanly kind of understandable, <laughs> easily readable, but you know it's actually quite a simple idea. You have a, a number of items with a number of fields associated. You need to map them, and the product suppliers will do a lot of that for you. So you don't necessarily need to do a huge amount of legwork. But if you've customised your repository at all, you need to bear that in mind. And also, I think that the companies tend to match against the vanilla instance of your repository. So again, you just need to be aware that they might have missed some stuff. The other thing that you should be aware of, I think, is that there are different approaches to how to handle legacy data. So, um, one company, for example, matches their records with records in your existing repository. If you don't get a match, that means that the stuff in the repository is not necessarily represented in the current research information system. That might not be a problem, it might be out of scope for what your current research information system is. Uh, but you need to be aware of that. And I think if I was doing it again, I want everything pretty much that was in the repository to be reflected in the research information system without me having to do a load of extra uh, legwork. But other companies, again, you know, they, they approach it in a different way, so may import everything. Um, so, for example, you might have a lot of legacy data imported and matched against academic staff at the institution. That can work very well, and again, a lot of the legwork is done by the company. But, for example, it depends on the decisions that have been taken by the people procuring and setting up your research information system. So say you decided only to put in uh, current staff or um, staff with research in their contract. Not everybody who's got stuff in the repository might be represented in the research information system. So again, you just need to think about what records you've got. Can you represent them in the research information? Do you want to? And once they're in both places, if effectively what happens is there's a link between the two records. It's a one-off legacy issue. For newer content, depending upon your deposit mechanism, the issue shouldn't arise. But it is something to be aware of, this sort of matching process. Matching with individuals, matching with academic units, and making sure that the match is correct from, from your research information system to your repository record. Um, you indicated that you had a lot of detailed work to do during the process of setting this up when the integration was happening. Yeah. Subsequent to that, obviously, the things are working together. Has your work changed the nature of your work and the amount of time you have to commit to um, the repository changed now that you actually have an integrated repository? Because you're a repository manager, you expect perhaps their job to be somewhat different in the integrated environment. I think in terms of liaison, in the run-up to the integration and ongoing, that you have to have a very close relationship with the research office and any relevant IT staff. You might already have that anyway in the repository sphere, but you might not, and I think it's, it's probably cemented the relationship that we already had. So we have an ongoing um, meeting regularly uh, to just review how things are going, talk about things like upgrading. So you might need to think about uh, any implications of upgrading your research information system and how that interacts with the version of, of your repository software. In terms of workflow, um, yeah, it is quite different and it means, well, obviously our, our situation is slightly unusual because we're interacting with more than one system, but in one system, the workflow, it feels like it needs to um, evolve a little bit more to make it smoother. So we're interacting with both the research information system and the repository for any given record quite often. It's just the way that the connector set up. It's slightly rough and ready. Now, and I think that, that that's understood. It needs to develop and it needs to be more of a, of a conversation between the two systems so that there's a better feedback loop, particularly information being fed back from the repository to the research information system so that you can manage the deposit process both from the author's point of view so that they know what the status of the, the deposit is and also from a repository staff point of view. Um, there may be things that we can do, it's, it's definitely still under review as to whether we can shift the workflow entirely into the, either the research information system or the repository. It feels a bit clunky to be trying to interact with, with both and obviously it does take a little bit longer to do it that way. 
Um, with other systems, you'll find that the workflow actually is moved almost entirely back into the research information system. So, uh, again, the workflow is entirely different. The process is very similar, you know, checking the metadata, looking at the version file that's been uploaded, checking the copyright positions. That's all effectively the same. The workflow will look a bit different and um, you know, it, it might not be repository based. So that might give you a little less control of what it actually looks and feels like. Um, because you know, if it's a commercial product, you can input and suggest, but it's not like working with an open access system, uh, an open source system where you can think, well actually that help text doesn't read very well, let's just change it. It's not as straightforward as that. So you lose some control looks a bit different, but actually a lot of the core processes are pretty much the same, but some of the relationships that you start to build are perhaps a little bit different. On the subject of relationships, you mentioned the procurement process earlier. Yeah. Do you think it's possible for repository managers to become involved in the procurement process, mm -hmm. should they should they get involved in the procurement process? And during the procurement process, if they are involved, what kind of issues should they be raising with the other people who are commissioning the system? Okay, yes definitely I think it's something to become involved in either the repository manager or a senior library uh, member of staff. Somebody who perhaps from a strategic point of view needs to drive the decision but also from a repository manager perspective the sort of nitty gritty of, um, of metadata quality. Mm -hmm. Really, the library of all departments at the university cares most about uh, the quality of the data. Mm. That's what libraries are about. I mean, it's a happy medium, and I think that's a conversation to be had about what kind of quality mechanisms you want to put into uh, the metadata that you have in your research information system. That might not be the full text records. It could be all the, 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 the um, totality of the records you've got in your publication database which is obviously going to be quite a large body of work. And there's some practical discussions to be had there about does the library have a role in that ongoing quality process? And the, the answer may not be yes, but I think you need to have a think about whether that's something that the library would like to become involved in. And if you do, then that's certainly useful from the decision-making point of view. Um, those sorts of detailed questions about where data is going to be sourced from, um, what will it look like when it's pulled in. So if you're creating a research information from scratch, a research information system, and building a publication database, so certainly one of the partners was in that situation, the metadata may be pulled in from you know, Thomson Web of Science, um, Scopus, or other sources like that. But equally, there may well be well-established departmental databases of publication data which will be of hugely varying quality. So somebody has to make a decision and, and perhaps review the quality of those sources as well, decide which sources are going to be imported, how we deal with, with duplicates. So certainly that's a new role for one of the libraries has been tidying up uh, duplicate data through the current research information system and that wasn't something that was a role for that library before. So, and I, and I think that research offices and other, other areas of the university value the library input um, into the decision making process and then thinking about the operational requirements of the eventual system. Looking a little further ahead now, we've, you've got integrated repositories at all three of your consortium members. What do you think are the next likely developments and challenges that you're going to be facing with the repositories? Um, I'm thinking of things like, for example, the integration of research data perhaps mm. into the repository, or you may, there may be other things that are on your agenda. So where, where are we likely to be going from here onwards? Well, um, okay, I'll just say something about advocacy before I sort of mm. future gaze, in that I don't, okay, Maybe a few years down the line we have got properly embedded repositories. At the moment I'd say, although we've been around for a while and that we're working with research information systems, we're moving in a particular direction, there's a long way to go before, before we really are embedded. And actually, at root, there's still a huge issue around awareness of repositories and the reasons for engaging with them at all. This is not new, but it's not gone away either. So even though the deposit mechanism might be a bit different, say, actually all the advocacy messages 
are pretty much the same as they were a few years ago and they're still around copyright, around awareness, around selling the benefits of, of a repository. So if you've, if you've crossed that barrier, if you've got there and persuaded a sufficient number of academics to engage and, and deposit, and deposits, you know, straightforward, then I guess, you know, we'd be looking at expanding uh, the types of materials that are deposited. And that's an ongoing conversation at, at least two of the three, in fact probably all three uh, institutions. So, if you're expanding to multimedia content, which actually two of the institutions already have, where does that live? And does that interact with the current research information system, or is that entirely separate? So, we do have a particularly complex architecture, so we have the sim single ePrints instance, but we also have multimedia content in a um, digital repository uh, in Leeds and the University of York uses the Fedora system and so they're already, we are already expanding into a much wider range of digital content, uh, multimedia and data is very much on the agenda and I think that again if, if fully functioning and working properly and I just think we're a long way off that, that ultimately you would want to, to use your research information system to the fullest extent and that means bringing together all the relevant pieces of information that's going to help researchers and also help administrative processes in the institution. But the researchers are the key. They're the people who really need to believe in the system in order to engage with it, I think. Um, so you would bring together information about grants and what's related to a grant. So that could be conference information, it could be published papers, it could be data, but it could be all sorts of other things that have been generated as part of of research. So I think there's a lot of work still to be done to bring these disparate um, parts of research together to make something really exciting and I'm sure that that, it's a conversation that's already started, it feels like there's quite a way to go and it's likely to, to uh, figure largely in the future. What I'm quite keen to do, and it's not really future gazing, but it's it is about embedding really, it's closing that loop with the researcher so and hopefully it will become self self perpetuating that you persuade people to engage, they deposit their research, possibly research papers, maybe other materials as well but they need to see that, that it's been worth the investment of their time so that means demonstrating impact, it means really good statistical feedback to them about the usage of their papers you know, if we can show them any um, advantage in terms of citation, for example, that would be great. But just collating any c kind of impact that the deposited materials is having and feeding that back regularly. Because one thing that academics say, you know, that they'll engage and then actually making it a regular part of their day-to-day -day work is really difficult. And you have to keep reminding them, and, but reminding them in a meaningful way so that they see an impact and ideally some way that is relevant to their subject discipline because that's what they're most interested in. And that's what we, I'd really like to see more development in that area so that we make sure that the repositories aren't seen as part of it, just an administrative system. It's not box ticking. You're not just doing it because you have to. It's because it's genuinely relevant for your uh, subject discipline. It helps you with the impact of your research. Hopefully it puts you in touch with other researchers and you can see that developing through the feedback that we're able to provide. So I'd like to see a lot more you know, discussion and thinking maybe about how we can make the most from a subject point of view uh, of the materials that are deposited. One last question then related to some of that. One of the one of the drivers that could either move this forward or inhibit it, we're going to be faced with the REF yeah. very soon. Mm. And I'm wondering if that is also featuring on <laughs> your short term landscape yeah. and how mm. it would it would it do you see it as something that will actually help mm. your advocacy process as well to get people to use it. Okay. I think on avoid the ref, um, you have to be careful about about pitching too strongly in the context of the ref because then you you might only get a, a, a subsection of papers that are being deposited to ref, for example. But again, it's an opportunity, and I think that institutions that got involved with the RAE in, in the repository context probably benefited quite heavily from having some involvement in that process. 
so it's it's very loaded so it's it's um, again you know you'll get mixed reactions if you mention ref to to academics however there is an opportunity there and also i think there are some un unanswered questions which may change the way we think about the ref so for example there is still an ongoing discussion about what impact means so when we talked about impact we've been thinking about you know what what papers you've chosen and what their citation counts were and so on and maybe there's a repository role there to say well you can boost your visibility at least by getting the material into the repository and getting it out out to to a wider readership but also impact could go back for many years actually and there could be lots of research that's involved in informing a case study which is demonstrating impact so, and we might need to be able to supply that to TEFKI. So I think actually the the impact of REF might be slightly different that it does push us to collect more digital material and I think uh, we may have a role in supplying that material to, uh, to panels uh, particularly maybe the unpublished stuff that's perhaps a bit, bit more difficult to, to get a hold of. I'm envisaging that we would, again, it may be different to each of the partners, but that the repository will have open, open access copies of research. But we might also need to have a function where we house, say, the published versions in a dark archive which actually we already do and we can do that but it might become a more formal part of what we do so we don't want to compromise on getting the right stuff to make openly available but I think in terms of embedding and offering a valuable service in the context of the ref that you might need to just think about is there another role here for us in terms of digital curation and as on the back of that can we be getting more open access stuff getting more profile and just making ourselves really part of the institutional infrastructure in such a way that post ref the momentum continues and we carry on getting uh, content that's a very useful point to make i think that all of these things stipulate something but you have to keep going mm -hmm. thank you for your insights into how to do that and I'm sure this will be very helpful to other repository managers. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.